All right. Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to start a new unit, sort of continues, um, picks up on the ideas from the last unit um, to take them further. But first I'm going to give you a bit of perspective and a bit of history to explain sort of what happened. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at what was happening before 2009, um, when people were working on image recognition, like image classification, they were working with pretty small data sets. So we have seen MNIST, 70,000 examples, 28 by 28 images. Another popular one, um, we'll use it in one of the demos, is Cipher 10. It's sort of similar in terms of the size and dimensionality, although it's color. And, um, and so here is a picture of some examples from Cipher. So there's 10 classes. And <clears throat> you can see the images are not very high resolution. They're just barely enough resolution to really make out what what is in the class. Um, but that's a really popular data set uh, to play around with things. And there were some other data sets like this, Pascal VOC. Um, <clears throat> the images were a little bit bigger, but there were fewer examples um, and so on. So <clears throat> at the time, still, because of the processing power that people had, they still struggled with the size of these data sets. Um, <clears throat> And so somebody, um, Fei Fei Li, she had this idea that at the time was, was almost kind of the opposite of, of what most people were thinking. Her idea was actually, we don't have enough data. Um, when you really need more data to do, to do better in terms of building algorithms or, or methods. Um, so it was, it was kind of a very unconventional idea at the time because it already seemed like, you know, the, the data we have is already too big, it's already too complex. Um, and so she had a very ambitious goal, which was to map out the entire world of objects. Um, so she eventually collected 14.2 million images more than 20,000 classes. And the way that the classes are organized is they're organized hierarchically. And they built on an earlier, um, an earlier data set that's uh, not, not about images, but just about words um, and categories. And so just one example of, of this uh, hierarchicalness of it would be like mammals, placental mammals, carnivores, canines, dogs, working dogs, husky. So basically, the idea is like any, any idea um, in the English language, people kind of split up hierarchically like this in WordNet, and then she wanted to fill out all the visual examples of those things. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of challenges in doing this uh, because, number one, you can find plenty of images on the internet. And you know, back then, you, there were less, but you could still find plenty. But the problem is they're not labeled. They're not labeled with the class. Uh, so how do you do that? How do you label 14 million images? So um, she had this idea to use something called Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is a service where you can pay random people around the world to do really simple tasks. And so they would, they would basically um, label these images. They would probably get paid like a cent or two per image. Um, and, and that is how she was able to get all of these things labeled. And <clears throat> the details are in this 2009 paper. Um, but that was, that was sort of um, what she did. There's a, it's, it's described in this really nice article. And <clears throat> Once that data set was out there, um, there was a, a competition that was held yearly from 2010 to 2017 called the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, ILSVRC. And every year they had a 
different set of um, competitions within that challenge. And so, like, for example, in 2012, uh, they had three different competitions or you know, tasks. So one of them was classification with a 1,000 classes. And um, the methods would list the five most likely guesses per image cl of, of classes. And then they would, they would um, basically be, the guess is correct if the true class is one of the top five. <clears throat> uh, they had another competition, fine grain classification, where they were looking at 120 different categories of dog. So that's pretty tough, right, to tell between 120 tw 20 dog breeds. Um, <clears throat> and then they had another competition, which was classification with localization, where in addition to saying what class is the overall image, they wanted a bounding box, a rectangle, um, that said, and, and here it is within the image. Um, <clears throat> because all these other tasks, you, you're just coming up with one single label for the entire image. Um, and that kind of brings in the challenges with, with doing that is that in most images, there's actually many things present, right? So it's kind of hard to say what a given image is about. Um, like, for example, this, this picture here was labeled as grill. So, you know, that's probably not what I would think of labeling that as. I'd probably label it as a car. Um, and another issue is that um, the size of the objects within the image can scale quite a bit. So you could have, um, you know, like the size of a mushroom here is this big, but you could also imagine another image with a much bigger mushroom or, you know, here's cherries that are actually quite large, the dog is quite small and so on. So it's so just like when you say that there's this object is in that image, it's it could be of many different s scales. Um, it could also be rotated in strange ways. There could be strange lighting on it, like this one I think is particularly hard. For this one, there's a lot going on here. There's people, there's cars, there's signs, there's a street. Uh, but this is labeled as motor scooter, and the motor scooter is actually quite dark. Um, it's kind of, you know, unless you zoom in, it's almost hard to see that motor scooter. And then things can be occluded, meaning you don't get to see the full object. So like this might here, you know, part of it is missing, um, <clears throat> and so on. So, so these are all the challenges you face when you do image, um, image classification. So when you look at what was happening <clears throat> over the years, 2010, 2011, so this is, this is just the um, accuracies that people were able to get on that um, thousand class competition. And <clears throat> so you can see that there was not that much progress being made from 2010 to 2012 among these traditional computer vision methods, things like support vector machine. Um, we'll talk about tree-based methods. Um, I don't know if those are used, but it's kind of classical stuff. But then in 2012, <clears throat> this is when the first deep neural network uh, <clears throat> was, was proposed and entered in this com competition. And you can see it was a huge jump over what was possible previously um, and, and as well as that year and even the next year, you can see like people just basically stopped trying with the conventional methods. And from that point on, it was all about these deep networks and you can see there's at that point like a very steady, um, very steady progress is made year by year. So this was sort of the beginning now of this deep network revolution. Um, <clears throat> there's kind of two examples of it. One is this um, in, in image processing, and then you have another example in speech processing that was about the same time. It was a breakthrough over classical speech recognition methods. So, <clears throat> so anyway, this was, yeah, this is basically the beginning of now the third wave of, of artificial intelligence. Once this happened, people got really excited about this stuff and started putting in tons of resources and, you know, now everything has exploded and there's just huge amounts of, of money and attention going into this field. <clears throat> this, um, this first uh, 
network that won that year is called AlexNet. Um, it was by Jeff Hinton at University of Toronto. You may have heard of him. He's still quite um, famous and active in, in machine learning. And um, <clears throat> we'll, be, we'll be talking about AlexNet, and we'll be getting, digging into the details of, of how they did this uh, later in this unit. Any questions on anything so far? Okay, <clears throat> so um, so this is what AlexNet looks like. Let me first, so this is sort of a visualization of it, but let me point out that this visualization is, again, maybe a little different from what you might expect, at least uh, as based on electrical engineering. Um, you, would, you might think that these blocks are processing blocks. They're actually the opposite, they're the data. They're this, the shape of the, of the data that goes into each layer of the network. So in the first layer, um, so Im ImageNet is based on 224 by 224 images, color. So for color images, you have red, green, blue channels. And so that is the input to the network. Then <clears throat> um, we'll talk about this, but there's a, a linear layer that is um, called the convolutional layer followed by uh, scalar nonlinearity and so on. That convolutional layer is represented by that uh, red object. Going into the next uh, layer, the first hidden layer, this is the shape of the data. <clears throat> and so what is happening as you go through is that the spatial resolution is being decreased. You're going from 224 by 224 spatial pixels to 55 by 55. But there's another kind of resolution, which we can think about it as colors if you want, or more generally, we, we call them channels. That is actually increasing. It's increased from 3 to 96. And it's almost like there's 96 different colors uh, here in the middle of this network. Now, we as humans, we can only see in three colors. But there's actually mammals that can see, sorry, um, I don't know about mammals, but, but there's definitely other uh, creatures out there that can see in more than three colors. There's, I think, some shrimp that can see in hundreds of colors. Um, but anyway, this, this neural network can also interpret many colors, uh, many channels. And so what you see is, as you go through, um, gradually the spatial resolution decreases, but this other resolution keeps increasing. And when you exit the network, as we know, if this is... If the, if the goal of this network is to do thousand class classification, then the output of this should be a vector with a thousand numbers in it, right? It should be like a, a softmax, like a probability mass function, or it could be just linear scores, but there should be a thousand of them. So the task of the network is to take those color images and eventually, gradually, translate them to this thousand by one output. And that's something you can sort of see happening <clears throat> as you go through here. Um, so their goal at the time <clears throat> was to build a very deep network. Now, by today's standards, this is not a very deep network, but at the time it was incredibly deep. And they had to um, use a bunch of new tricks to get this to work. Um, and we'll talk about those. Um, ReLU was one trick, uh, max pooling, dropout, and so on. Um, and then another important thing to note is that uh, compared to, you know, maybe other models that people were training at the time, this was really huge. 60 million parameters, 650,000 neurons um, in this network. So this was really gigantic, especially um, for the processing power that they had at the time. <clears throat> okay, so this, but anyway, this is the one that, that won that... Uh, that competition. This is the breakthrough. Any questions? Okay, so um, <clears throat> so let's understand a little bit about how this works. So this is just sort of a, a recap of what we saw in the previous unit. In that unit, we um, we we coded up a, a demo in PyTorch that was a two-layer network, and it was the goal was to classify um, a data set that looked very much like this. There's some um, of one class in the middle and the other class surrounding it. And we know that linear classification doesn't work like that, but we saw that if you built a two-layer network, <clears throat> it did work. 
And we interpreted what was going on as, in that case, we were intersecting these different half spaces. <clears throat> so this picture here is from a visualization cool tool called TensorBoard, which essentially does the same sort of stuff that we coded manually in the last unit. Um, it, it can help you visualize what is happening at all the neurons within um, an, uh, a network of you know, two or, or more layers. And so here, for example, <clears throat> you see these little pictures like we were drawing. So this would say that um, this layer is a linear classifier that is basically splitting um, the data into you know, two half spaces, one with a positive score, one with a negative score, and then here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one. And then those four are being combined to a single output that gives you this heat map. Okay, so this is just sort of doing all this automatically. Um, it, it was originally for um, tensor. Um, <clears throat> so so it's, it's, it's in, PyTorch, in PyTorch is a version of it. Um, so... So this is what we know uh, happens in, in, you know, for two-layer networks. So what happens if you have a more complicated classification task? So this is still binary, but you can see that it's not as simple as this. So is there a way that we can tackle this? This is called the, the Swiss roll. Can we tackle this Swiss roll? Um, and the idea is, yeah, you can. You just need to add some more layers. <clears throat> so in here we see this tensor board again. So in this case, we have three hidden layers instead of one. The first hidden layer is working the same way as before. Um, each of these is like a classifier. So you know we have these linear boundaries. Um, the next hidden layer is working like our output layer did last time. So it is intersecting these different half spaces to get some different shapes. And you can see all kinds of different shapes are made. This one looks just like the one uh, from you know, the last unit, but then there's these other ones that are sort of interesting. It's like there's this and this and, and so on. So you get these different shapes, <clears throat> but then in the next hidden layer, it is combining these shapes, which are no longer simple half spaces, they're more complicated, and it's combining them to do even more interesting things. And finally, those things are combined to get this final um, decision region like this, which is you know, complicated enough to do uh, quite a good job on the, on the training data. So, so that's essentially what you get when you add more layers in your network. You, it, it, you get this hierarchical combination of these things, these simple things are combined to be more complicated. These more complicated things are combined to be even more complicated and so on and so on as you go down the network. <clears throat> so then you can do more, more uh, sophisticated tasks. Right. Any questions on anything here? So, so the idea with, with deep networks is basically you just keep doing this. You just keep adding layers. Um, and maybe you have a lot of hidden nodes too. And eventually you can do really sophisticated tasks like you know, distinguish between images of cats and dogs or whatever you want to do. Um, and this is also how the mammalian brain works as well. So. Um, <clears throat> So in the mammalian brain, there are these different regions um, that, so this is, this is for visual processing, the so-called V1, V2, and so on. So your retina are, are connected to V1, and V1 is doing relatively simple processing on the patterns on your retina. It's, it's looking for textures and, and edges and simple shapes, and those things you know, there's, there's many neurons in here, and as you go through them, they get more sophisticated, and then eventually it becomes the V2 area, which is, again, more sophisticated, more high-level, and it keeps getting more and more high-level as you, as you go 
through the brain, very similar to the uh, the neural network that you know this one or um, <clears throat> at, you know these these deep neural networks that that do this great job in in classifying images. So there really are connections with what's seen in biology. And what's even maybe a little bit more interesting is um, people who have studied this V1 layer, they've done experiments where they've been able to figure out exactly which patterns V1, which visual patterns V1 is responding to, like particular neurons. They can figure out, like, this one is responding to a checkerboard. This one is responding to that. And the things that it responds to are actually very, very similar to the things that are learned in the first layer of a deep network for um, you know, visual tasks like image classification. So that's pretty cool. So just a little bit of history. So the first deep network was from the mid-60s. Uh, first convolutional deep network is from 1980. And backpropagation, which we learned about, that procedure was developed in the 80s. Um, in the early days of doing this, as we know, if you have limited training data then, and, and you want to have many parameters, that's a problem because you'll, you'll overfit. <clears throat> they also had limited computational power. And there was another problem that um, was tackled, I think, for the first time in AlexNet called the vanishing gradient. So um, that kind of goes like this. So if you think about um, a ReLU, Uh, sorry, not ReLU, uh, Sigmoid. Sigmoid has, sorry, I, sh I shouldn't have, uh, didn't really need to draw that. Okay, so, so Sigmoid has a shape like this. So we saw that when you do backpropagation, what you do is you, you compute a gradient in one layer, and then that gradient gets essentially multiplied by another gradient as you go left, and that gets multiplied by another gradient, and so on and so on. And when you think about the values of the gradient for this sigmoid, or tan h, um, <clears throat> so when you're right in the center, if you had a point right in the center, this has a slope of 1. But as soon as your point is off the center, like here, this slope is less than 1. You know, maybe it's um, I don't know, 0 0.3 or something. And so the problem is when you have many of these sigmoids, um, and if you have a sample that's not sitting right in the exact center of the sigmoid, the gradient is less than 1. That gets multiplied, you know, pushed down the chain, and then there's another gradient less than 1, less than 1, less than 1, and the overall gradient magnitude gets closer and closer and closer to 0. So that when you reach the the beginning of your network, you know, all the way left, the gradients are so small that they just can't really change the parameters. They, you, you can't really adapt those training parameters because your gradients are tiny. So this is called the vanishing gradient problem. <clears throat> and uh, the big breakthrough was to not use these sigmoids, but instead to use the, um, <clears throat> the ReLU activation. So the ReLU we saw looks like, um, I'll draw that like this. ReLU looks like this. And so the nice thing about the ReLU is everywhere um, to the right is zero, this slope is exactly one, the gradient is exactly one. So it doesn't uh, decrease at all, it doesn't vanish at all. It is true that here um, it is exactly zero, um, for any samples that are negative. Um, that doesn't usually cause a problem uh, in that, you know, most samples, well, you won't have all your samples negative, so some will be negative, some won't be negative. The ones that are non-negative, their, their gradients, or ones that are, yet yeah, positive, their gradients will not vanish. So this largely satisfies this uh, vanishing gradient problem, just the use of these ReLUs. So that was... Um, just sort of a trick, but it's, it was one of the things that was just super important to getting this to work. <clears throat> There's other things, too. Uh, we'll talk uh, 
more today about convolutional layers. So this is another thing we need. We can't afford to use these big uh, matrix multiplies um, because when you think about the size of images, the number of pixels in an image, it's usually huge, like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. You can't build a matrix that's like a million by million matrix. Um, you can't you can't implement it. You can't multiply by it. You also can't learn all those parameters. So, um, so the the typical type of um, linear layers that we've been using, they're not appropriate for images. They're just too big. So um, instead, we have to do something that's linear, but it's more constrained. And it turns out to be really all that we need. Um, and it's these convolutional layers, which we'll talk about. There's other tricks. Um, we'll talk about these later. Um, later in this unit. And these things are, are what really made it possible to, um, to get that good performance. All right. So <clears throat> any questions on anything? Yes? So you said if we add more hidden layers, we can do more complex um, tasks, right? Yeah. So you're not limited by computational power. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, you just keep increasing the number of hidden layers, and then you would just get much better accuracy. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess um, you probably don't need to go beyond a certain point. Um, but yeah, so there are, there are networks that um, have hundreds or I guess even thousands uh, of layers. We'll talk about how to do that. There's some special tricks you need to do that. And they, yeah, they do have, um, at the time, they were a huge breakthrough. Um, and that was actually a trend over the mid uh, 2010s was to go deeper and deeper and deeper precisely for that reason. Um, so so in, in some sense, yes, that, that, is, that is what you want. Of course, yeah, there's, in the end, that's not, that's not everything, right? You, there's other things you need to do well too. So, but yes, lar largely speaking, yeah, you, you really do want these things to be deep. Um, although maybe it's not strictly necessary always. Maybe. Maybe you can find a very good performing network that's not as deep, but it's doing, it's deep enough. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Any other? Yeah. So let's say you're trying to like make your network bigger. How do you? You mean deeper or yeah, wider? Deep, yeah. How would you decide, or I guess you're trying to like predict something better. How would you decide like whether to add more layers or make the layers you already have just like more nodes? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Cross validation. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, these are great questions. These, these are the things you have to design uh, in any given application, any given data set. You you have to just try different depths, different widths, which is the number of hidden nodes, and you don't necessarily have to use the same number of hidden nodes at every layer. So you you know you could have something that kind of gets large and then shrinks again. There's just a lot of degrees of freedom. So, um, you know, part of it is you, you can kind of look at what other people have done and be like, okay, that, that seems to be a, a decent strategy. You don't want your search space to be so massive because it's computationally expensive to even try out any given thing. So, like, you, you really got to kind of limit um, the space of what you're searching over. If, if you're searching over, like, um, you know, different numbers of hidden nodes at each layer. There's so many possibilities. So, um, but those are, those are things that there's, there's no, uh, there's no easy answer. There's no like correct thing. Um, so it's, it's just sort of for, for a given data set, for a given amount of processing power and memory and all that, you, you sort of try a bunch of stuff out. And so that's something you'll get to do for the project. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Any other questions? Okay. Great. So, um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about this convolution idea. Um, so we said that sort of the way these things work is um, <clears throat> as you go through the network, uh, the early processing is looking for sort of simple patterns, and then those are put together to become more and more complex as you go through the network. So um, and the sort of simple patterns that you might see originally are things like line segments, curves, bumps, things like that. So maybe 
Maybe they are shapes like this. So for example, um, so here in these pictures, uh, gray would be zero. Let's say white would be positive and black would be negative. So <clears throat> when we're talking about a shape like this, um, well, okay, I guess, I guess we'll talk a little bit more about convolution to understand how those shapes are used. But the idea for now is we're looking for these simple local patterns like edges or dots or bumps or whatever. And as we know with images, these things can really be located anywhere in the image. Um, when you think about images, if you think about like what's on the left side of the image versus what's on the right side of the image, there's really not that much difference in general, right? Um, sometimes top to bottom, like sometimes you might say, well, I'm looking at pictures of, of outdoor scenes, and so I expect to see sky on the top and maybe, you know, grass or a street or something on the bottom. So maybe there are some differences top to bottom in particular scenarios. But overall, like we don't, you know, we, we kind of think of like the things we're looking for could happen anywhere in the image. So there's this notion of translation invariance. Um, the things we're looking for um, could be anywhere. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, so we just want to find these, these kind of patterns that could be anywhere. And the patterns we're looking for, especially originally, they're simple. So maybe they don't need to be like these giant complex patterns. Maybe they can just be sort of a relatively small pattern. Um, may, maybe, like, maybe like this. So this, oops, this thing is sort of like saying, OK, I want something which is low here and high here. So as we'll see, that sort of corresponds to an edge, uh, maybe a localized edge. And maybe this is something we want to look for everywhere in the image. So the way that we can do that is we can do this with, with pattern matching is one way to, to say it. <clears throat> um, and the idea is you have a template for what you're looking for. Um, that template we, we often call a kernel. And the idea is to shift around that template until you find something that matches it within the image. So um, this is sort of contrived, but let's say that our template was this four shape. And let's say we had an image like this with a bunch of other handwritten digits. And now we're looking for areas, we're looking for four type patterns within here. So what we could do is we could take this template and we could just slide it around at different places and then in order to figure out if it's a good match there, just imagine it as sort of like a little matrix. Do a pointwise multiply between that template, its pixels, and the pixels below it in the image, and sum them up. So if there's a good correspondence, um, so in this case, things are a little bit flipped compared to usual. So let's say that white is 0 and black is, um, is positive. So when that template is over here, you can imagine a lot of those positives are going to be hitting these positives, and you'll sum it up and you'll get a large number. So for that location of the template, you get a big output. On the other hand, if the template is like over here, where that 4 is not really going to hit much, then you're going to get you know zeros multiplying 1s and 1s multiplying by zeros, and, and you'll get a small output. So this is basically the, the main idea, is you have this thing, this template you're looking for. You just slide it around everywhere. And you look for the places where that pattern match, that pointwise multiplying and summing operation, is large. <clears throat> That's it. Is that sort of making sense from? OK. And the way that this looks like in an equation, and it's important to understand this, because we'll see a lot of this. The equation looks like this. <clears throat> so. The variables k are indexing over the locations within the template. So if we say that 0 is to the bottom left, let's say this would be k is k1, k2 are both 0. So as k1 increases, we're going up this way. As k2 increases, we're going this way. Um, and so this, this is now for a fixed output j1, j2. So, so here is j1, j2. That, that tells us 
the output. So that tells us essentially the location of where the template is. We do our, our sum um, across these Ks. And we sum up all those Ks and we get the output at that location. And I want to do this operation for all the different Js. So I keep sliding this around to all these different J1, J2s, like here's one, here's another one. And I, I just keep a record of the values that I, I found. So I'm looking to fill out this Z image for all J1 and J2. <clears throat> so that, that is the, this pattern matching. This, um, <clears throat> this procedure is called either correlation or convolution. Um, technically speaking, it is correlation. If you look at the traditional signal processing literature and you look at you know, what is the definition of two-dimensional correlation, it is exactly this, exactly this equation here. Um, <clears throat> It, within deep learning, it's been sort of renamed as convolution. Um, talk about that on the next page. But, but this, is, this is essentially what these convolution networks are doing. They're doing this many times at different stages. But let me pause here. Is this idea pretty clear? Is the math clear enough? OK, any questions on anything here? Yeah. Is it just shifted, or like, is it also scaled? How would you know if like the four in the image matches the size of the? Um, it is. Yeah, that's a great, great point. It is only shifted. Okay. So, um, so the the different scales um, ended up they they end up kind of happening over the different depths. Um, but yeah, like at least for for this kind of typical architecture, it's. Um, you can't really see different scales. But I guess you could have the template itself could, you know, you could have different sized fours. Um, but, um, but yeah, it is, it's just the shift. <clears throat> okay, so, um, <clears throat> all right, so then in, in terms of just the terminology, so this is the, this is the equation we saw on the previous page, exactly this. And um, here's a related equation. The, difference is that here these pluses have turned to minuses and down here this is what convolution is in terms of the traditional definition of convolution um, <clears throat> essentially the easiest way to understand the difference between these I think is is essentially <clears throat> in the bottom case what happens is the template gets flipped in both dimensions. So the way to see that is to do a variable substitution where you replace K1 with, let's say, negative L1. You replace K2 with negative L2. And then so what you get is you have negative L1, negative L2, and then you have plus L1, plus L2. And so now you can see that these agree. And the difference now is that rather than going through, you know, let's say up and to the right, now you go down to the left for your, for your kernel. So it's sort of like you're doing this, this operation, but your template has been reversed. It gets flipped horizontally and vertically, so it looks, um, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard for me to... Okay, so it's, that would be a horizontal flip, and then a vertical flip, I guess, looks like that. So that's sort of what, um, the, that, that's essentially the difference between convolution and correlation. Um, <clears throat> correlation, uh, so, so, yeah, sometimes this operation is called convolution without flipping and reversal, whereas this is called convolution with flipping and reversal. So <clears throat> the point is that essentially they're extremely similar. If you want to make them exact, all you need to do is flip your template. Um, but this template flipping is is like something that doesn't really it doesn't really help you at all. So, as long as you can just do this, that's sort of easier. Um, and so that is what has been implemented in these neural networks is is essentially this correlation operation. Even though people call it convolution, they call these convolutional neural networks. <clears throat> 
they're doing this. Um, so, so that's that's essentially this this idea. So, um, like in PyTorch, this is done. This this overall operation here is done in Torch Neural Network Conv 2D, two dimensional convolution. You can also do one dimensional convolution. Uh, there, you just have. Um, <clears throat> You know, maybe you have amplitudes along a line, and if you convolve it with a pulse like this, you basically slide that pulse over, you keep sliding it over, and this operation is done in one dimension. You can do it in three dimensions, where you have a volume and you have a three-dimensional kernel, and that is sliding around. So you can do a convolution in any dimension you want. <clears throat> if you have a one-dimensional data set, you definitely want to do one-dimensional convolution. Two-dimensional data, 2D convolution, and so on. Um, so that's that's essentially what what is happening. Although it, we'll see, it's a little bit more complicated. But this is sort of the the main idea here behind convolution and, and how it is used in these neural networks as in the form of this pattern matching. All right. So any questions? Okay. So um, so now there's. A few details to discuss, such as what happens at the edge of the image. So there's some um, there's different ways to handle these edge effects. So <clears throat> let's see. So what we have um, in these pictures is so this thing is the image. This thing is the kernel. I'll write the input image. And then this is the output image, or the result of the convolution. So, so here are some options. So in what's known as valid mode convolution, um, <coughs> Here, okay, so here we have a three by three kernel, and we have a four by four image. Uh, it's very small for an image, but it, you know, still is good enough for this example. So, based on the idea of convolution now, um, if we don't allow the kernel to go outside the boundaries of the image, then there's really only four places it can be. It can be there, we can slide it to the right, we can slide it down, and we can slide it down and to the right. Those are the four shifts possible, and there's only four, and that will give us an output image that's only two by two. Does that make sense, this sliding around? And here, we're basically saying, like, I don't know what is outside of my original image, so I don't want to make any assumptions about what's out there, so I'm not going to let my kernel go outside the image, because as soon as the kernel goes outside the image, like here, you essentially have to make some assumption about what those pixels are, but you don't actually know what they are. So, so that's, um, so, you know, so we'll talk about that in a moment. But basically, the downside of doing this is that the image size shrinks. You start with an image that's 4x4. Four four, you get an image that's 2x2. Two two. So as you go through the network, your image would, if you kept doing this every layer, your image would get smaller and smaller and smaller in a way that maybe you don't want. Okay, so that is what's called valid mode. The sort of opposite extreme, <clears throat> called full mode, says you are allowed to move your kernel as far outside the image as long as it somehow overlaps with the image. So now you can see for the same size, you know, I guess this image is a little bit bigger. This is a 5x5 five five image. Um, we have you know, many, many places that we could shift the kernel to. We could shift it to any of these places here. And so as a result, our output image is now very large. In fact, maybe it's larger than we need it to be. <clears throat> the other thing that you see happening here is when you're talking about the edge pixel of the output image, this is really the kernel multiplying only a tiny piece of the original image and mainly operating on stuff that we have sort of inserted there um, as a guess of what was there, but we don't really know what was there. The most common guess people use is 
to put zeros there. So you just fill all these with zeros. And that's called zero padding. It's not the only option. There's more sophisticated things where you, like, you, you take your image and you do a mirror copy. Um, you sort of flip it over, flip it diagonally and so on. And, and that's a bit more realistic. There's another one where you take those edge pixels and you just copy them um, outward and so on. So there's different things you can do. The most common one is this zero padding. So these are the extremes. The thing that would be in between is to do however much padding you need based on your kernel size to get exactly the same output as input size. So if you're starting with, starting with a five by five and you have a three by three kernel, then you wanna pad with one uh, row of edge pixels here and that will give you also a five by five. And what's nice about this is your images would stay the same size as you go throughout the network. You don't have to worry about the size changing because of these padding effects. You do have to do, you do have to make some assumptions about how you're gonna pad. Maybe it's gonna be zeros, but, um, <clears throat> But those are, those are basically the, um, the options you have in order to handle the edge. And from what I've seen, this, um, this one same mode is the most common that you see. Yeah. With the, um, the valid mode, because like, I'm looking at the corner pixels, because they're only kind of sampled once, would this like weight, this would weight like the inner pixels more because they're, they're like used in more of the samples? Um, yeah, that's, that's maybe one way to think about it, too. Yeah, could be. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, okay, so any, any questions on these? Okay. So, and, you know, this is, these are just some examples of, of the details of it. Um, if you want to see with numbers, so, like, the big digits here are the underlying image, the kernel are these little ones. And if you want to know how was this computed, it's like three times zero plus three times one plus two times two plus zero times two and so on. You add up all those, you get 12. And then if you want to move your kernel, shift it to the right by one, you can see the kernel values are the same, but now it's just shifted over. You do three times zero plus two times one and so on. And you'll get, well, it turns out you get 12 again. But just, you know, the details of how you can get all those numbers to see exactly what convolution is doing. At least valid mode. <clears throat> okay. So let's take a look at what happens with, um, with a real image. So we're going to use this cameraman image, which is pretty famous in signal processing, image processing. Um, we'll use a couple new libraries. So one library is SciPy Signal. So this is sort of within Python. This is the signal processing kind of library. And then there's SK Image, um, like SK Learn, but now SK Image is for image processing. And <clears throat> we'll we'll um, look at a couple different applications of convolution. Um, the first thing we'll do is we'll just come up with a really simple uh, template, which is a template of, essentially it's like all ones. It's a nine by nine template of all ones, but we'll divide, we'll divide every entry by nine squared so that when you sum up all the numbers in the template, you get one. So <clears throat> essentially what happens is as you shift that template around, it just takes an average of the pixels underneath it and just reports the average. So as you, as you move that around, you know, it just averages the pixels. And the effect of this is to make the image blurred because now you can no longer have any sharp edges because um, <clears throat> as you move this averaging filter around, not too much changes from one pixel to the next. There's only like, you're only taking away like one edge and adding a new edge. All the other ones in the middle are the same. So essentially that's sort of an explanation for what's happening here. So you get this blurriness. This is the original one. These are the 
um, the blurred images. But what we're really looking at here is what's happening to the outer pixels because we have these different, um, this is full mode, same mode, valid mode. And the lower uh, row is just zoomed in. So this is, I don't know, this is 256 by 256. And here we're just looking at the 20 edge pixels. So you can see that in this top left corner, this it's just a sky, it's pretty uniform. But what happens is when you do zero padding, <clears throat> you're essentially putting dark pixels around the edge. And then when you have um, full mode, your kernel has mostly black pixels and only just this one gray pixel here. And so you get an almost perfectly black output in the top left of your, your output image. And you can see that, so this is the zoomed version. You can even see that here in the, um, in the non-zoomed version. So basically convolution with zero padding added this sort of dark edge. Now, when you do same padding, um, you do have some of that, but you, know, you didn't have as big of a dark um, padded region, so you have less of that problem. And if you have valid mode, then you never let your kernel escape the original image, and so you get this perfect gray sky, same shade as the original. <clears throat> but of course, notice how um, everything got averaged. So these little fluctuations here that you can see, um, they all got averaged out. So this is a very um, primitive way to do what's called denoising. If somebody gives you a really noisy image where the noise is of the sort of just very random, uh, yeah, very, very random noise, um, spatially, if you do this kind of filtering, you will remove the noise to a large extent and preserve most of the image, but the image will start to get blurry. So, you know, maybe this is probably too blurry, so maybe if you use a smaller kernel, you get a better trade-off between reducing noise and not blurring the image. But this is something, th this is a, a, probably like the, the main use case of this thing, this uh, simple averaging filter would be to denoise images. Okay, but mainly this picture is, this, this slide is just showing the different amounts of, uh, how, how zero padding and the different kernel modes affects the image. Right, any questions? Okay, so let's also look at a couple different kernel sizes, nine by nine versus 15 by 15. You can see with the nine by nine, um, that's what we had on the previous page, certain amount of blurring, 15 by 15, you can see it's even much more blurry because as the kernel gets bigger um, and you slide it, there's just less changes with the slide. There's just a bigger number of pixels that are all staying the same. So bigger kernel, more blurring. And we can also look at non-uniform kernels. So this kernel is called the Gaussian blur kernel. It is basically like a two-dimensional Gaussian. So um, it's highest in the middle and it has this sort of bell curve shape in both dimensions. Oops, in this dimension too, another bell curve. Um, so it's close to zero on the edges. Um, in terms of denoising, it tends to work better than that uniform one. Um, but you know, it still has that, that blurriness. This is the Gaussian nine by nine versus the uniform nine by nine. Basically what it does is it, it's weighted more towards the center, whereas the uniform one is, is just really averaging all the pixels, um, not, not putting a stronger weight on the center pixel. Um, so anyway, but this is sort of a building block you could use. And maybe a slightly more interesting pair of filters would be these Sobel filters. So, <clears throat> they can be used for edge detection. <clears throat> so here, this is a three by three, where we have zeros here, positive on the left, negative on the right. If we convolve with this, we expect to be able to tell um, 
let's say if there's bright on the left and dark on the right, that will give us a positive output, right? Because you'll have um, larger multiplied by larger, smaller by negative, and that will give you positive. On the other hand, this one will be able to detect uh, vertical changes. If you have bright on the top and dark on the bottom, this will give you a positive output. If you have dark on the top and bright on the bottom, it will give you negative output. Um, so we can apply that uh, to our cameraman and we can see that, um, so, so this was the one that was doing the detection of vertical edges. And you can see, for example, it did a great job of picking up, you know, things like this that are vertical. So let's see. So as you go from here to here, you go from light to dark, um, right at that boundary, you get this bright white edge. Um, when that Sobel filter is here, it sort of averages out to zero. When the Sobel filter is here, that also averages out. So it really is just picking up on the edge. Now, if we're talking about an edge that goes from dark to light, now you can see this is negative, so you get uh, this black edge versus the white edge. And this one is doing the edge detection vertically, so you can see it working here, whereas this one is not picking up on that vertical edge at all. <clears throat> okay, so it's sort of, you can do these interesting things, you can start to get a sense of how, you know, what, what these things in combination with convolution are, are pulling out of the image. This is basically doing edge detection. Um, so I think that's a, a great place to stop for today. Any, any questions? Yes. Um, in this case, were the numbers like one, two, were they kind of just chosen arbitrarily? Yeah, just chosen for simplicity. So. As those numbers, like if I double the numbers here, what would happen is the values in the output image was just double. You'd have twice the positive, twice the negative, zero would stay the same. So um, yeah, those, those are just chosen for simplicity. <clears throat> Another thing I didn't mention is that, um, so these Sobel filters, they have this sort of Gaussian shape in, in, this, in the dimension that they're not being used for edge detection. You can see they're center weighted. Um, instead of uniform. That, that, I think, just works better visually. It gives you nicer images. Okay. All right. Um, any, any other questions? Okay, great. So have a great weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday.